So you will have the presentation. An order coming from above, <laughs> Sam and Mike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, we're going to start. Thank you very much for being here. I hope that you will engage with us in the discussion. This open forum is about the OECD, what it does, but not only, it's also to engage with different stakeholders, people we do not always know in our meetings, on something which is the reverse of the fragmentation issue. We called it the economics of an open internet. Before we start, we enter the, the topic, I want to say a few words about what is the OECD for those if any who do not know what this organization is. So the mission of the OECD is to develop policies to improve, you know, it's better policies for better lives is the motto of the organization. It has a very strong record in informing policy through measurement, through indicators comparable that are across countries. And especially in this area, it develops consensus-based recommendations which are adopted by the Council. These are non-binding, but generally they represent a consensus not only of member countries but also our stakeholders, civil society, the business community and the internet technical community. And they work well because they've been developed in that environment. The OECD has 34 member countries, uh, cooperates with a lot of non-members, um, it is structured like a minister, ministry, like a ministry, sorry. And we have a committee specialized in digital economy policy. And it is that committee which is in charge of all policies that are related to the growth, the promotion of the digital economy, but also to addressing challenges that come with it. Just a couple of recent achievements. Um, we recently um, published a review of telecommunication policy and regulation in Colombia. And we also revised in 2012, although the publication is 13, um, our privacy guidelines which um, date back, dated back to 1980, the first international uh, instrument in this area. When it comes to um, digital economy and an open internet, 
The OECD approach is guided by 14 principles, which have been adopted because they, members and stakeholders considered that they represent best practice in this area. In other words, if you want economic growth and social well-being, there is a proven record, at least in OECD countries, because things may be different in developing countries, that respecting these principles when you develop policy give good results. And you see on the screen four of these principles. <laughs> it's my boss. <laughs> Is it the end? <laughs> four of these principles, which I think are more directly relevant to the topic of this uh, open forum, which is on openness. A couple of more words, couple more words about the OECD. The OECD has been present in the area of internet policy and governance forever. Uh, it's been a member, but then later on an observer to the GAG followed all the ICANN meetings, participates in all the IGF and shares its work and receives input from all communities and other international organizations. The OECD uh, participated in Net Mundial. Um, we also work with the Global Commission on Internet Governance, which has a research advisory network focusing on various issues related to internet policy and governance. In June, we had a high-level session with um, people coming from the US, but also from Brazil and from all stakeholders' sides to discuss the current landscape for internet policy and governance and how it may impact the activities of the OECD. And particularly important, we will organize, we start to organize a ministerial which will take place in 2016, end of, May, um, end of April, beginning of May, in Mexico. And Openness, the openness of the internet will be one of the themes, along with, given the level of maturity of the digital economy, elements that will focus on the impact of ICTs and the internet across the economy and across the society. I would like now to introduce my director, Andrew Wyckoff. I'm sure that many of you already know him. Um, Andy leads the work of the OECD on innovation, on business dynamics, science and technology, ICT policy, which he very well knows, <laughs> and the statistical work which is associated with each of these area. And he will now explain to you why an open internet is important from the OECD perspective. Thank you, Anne, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for coming to this uh, session. Uh, it's probably obvious to most people in this room, you take it for granted, of course, uh, the importance of an open internet. Um, but I think you have to remember that those of us in this room and here at this table represent a really small segment of the overall population and certainly the political environment that's, that, that's out there. And I think one of the important missions for the OECD, but also for the IGF, is to begin to have a broader community, particularly a broader economic community from the OECD pers perspective, understand how important the internet is to their everyday uh, economic activity and social welfare. I think this is quickly becoming better and better known, but you'd be surprised the number of CEOs or policymakers in areas other than communications and information society who don't quite understand how important it is. And we, we, we put up this, this figure here because we see from the OECD, which is a bit distinguished by having every policy area underneath its roof with the exception of military and intelligence, which is done by NATO. But we have health committee, we have an education committee, we have an employment and labor social affairs committee. 
taxes, transportation, you name it. And as you go to these different committees, you, we begin to increasingly see ICT issues arising up on their agenda. Let me just mention um, some of the areas we've done work in recently, and usually it's a partnership between the directorate that I manage with Ann and other colleagues here and these other parts of the OECD. One is on uh, information communication technologies for the environment, particularly smart infrastructure moving this area. We've done work on public sector information and how important it is to get that into the public domain. We've done work ongoing at the moment on health, wellness, and aging, uh, particularly a G7 mandate we have to harness big data in its use to dis discover uh, and treat dementia. Alzheimer's in particular. Um, we're working actively with the Education Directorate on information communication technologies in the areas of uh, education and particularly uh, MOOCs. Of course, with driverless cars, with that transportation group, and last but not least, everyone's favorite part, the tax collectors uh, who are worried. Understandably, I think, that there are aggressive tax management uh, techniques underway by some multinationals in particular to uh, erode uh, the profits they generate in one area and shift them to, to other low tax areas. Actually, this is done legally. It's just that the rules don't understand companies that are based on intangibles, intangible assets. They're more rooted in a tangible world of factories and machinery and products that you can touch and go out the front door. So it's with this in mind that I would just underscore the incredible importance of the openness in the internet because it affects every part of the economy and society. So that's why we're eager to undertake work in this area. And I just want to lay out a bit of a conceptual framework for you partly because we want your feedback and comment and input on what's missing. Uh, what are areas you think we should strengthen? What are areas we should avoid? I want to start off by saying, and Ann and I have had this discussion for, for a couple decades, um, economics should not be thought of narrowly, just market transactions. It, it has a very broad interpretation at the, at the OECD. Uh, it does mean businesses, markets, and observed economic activity. And we do like indicators, some of which are showing their age, things like GDP or productivity gains. Uh, but we interpret economics broadly to also mean social welfare, which tends to be a little bit harder to measure now and then. But there, there, there are concepts like what we call consumer surplus, which I'm happy to unpack, but maybe more broadly, innovation. And what's frequently said in this community, permissionless innovation, which is something that we are ardently behind because we see that as the driver of uh, e economies. And this is hard to measure, but not impossible. And the, the, the second area I'd like to talk about is assessing the impact of an open versus a closed internet. Now, analytically, this is relatively easy in some ways. Those of us who have my hairstyle can remember an era <laughs> before the internet existed and what that was like and the costs that were incurred by a lack of interoperability. I remember termination rates, no peering, no convergence or bundling, no over-the-top uh, providers, and no productivity boost that we saw in the latter half of the 90s in the early part of the 2000s. Um, and we can look at events like cables being cut, or countries electing to shut down the internet and get a proxy of what openness costs with this kind of binary open or closed. But analytically, uh, that's not a good proxy, we don't think. Uh, because the most likely future path of the internet will be a partial or selective fragmentation is, is our best guess. In fact, some of the actions that cause fragmentation to occur, like protecting even children online or limiting span, most would consider a good outcome, but are analytically one source of friction, possibly. Um, it's for this reason that we prefer the concept of the economics of an open internet to fragmentation, because the, the latter gives more of a negative connotation that may not be uh, fully justified. Let me just uh, conclude 
by, 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 by saying that as we look at the challenges to an open internet, um, I'm drawing uh, four large categories. Uh, the first would be a challenge to the internet architecture itself. And these mean interoperable, or the lack of interoperable uh, protocols. The second are public policy challenges, where policymakers want to reach in and achieve a policy goal that may result in some uh, challenge to the open internet. These could be whether sovereignty concerns, human rights concerns, or uh, economic concerns. And then there's the unintended effect of implementing those public policy uh, measures, some of which aren't written in a technical way at all. They're written in a policy perspective and they need to be interpreted and implemented in a technical way and this can have unintended effects. Uh, last but not least, the, law, the last made sheer category that we're thinking about is private sector conduct itself. Some of this lack of openness may be due to economic incentives by these players, particularly businesses, who want to make profits, want to return value to their shareholders, and a lot of competition isn't always useful for doing that. And so they like, in some cases, uh, to have a niche which is their own, uh, and this may lead to a lack of complete openness. With that, let me end and turn, but, and turn to the next speaker. Well, thank you very much, Andy, for this overall presentation of why at the OECD we believe that an open internet is good. Although, as you mentioned, uh, sometimes some kind of what people call fragmentation may be also beneficial at different levels. Um, I would like now to, to ask Pablo Marquez uh, to take the floor. Uh, Pablo is the executive director of the Commission for Communications Regulation of Colombia. And Pablo, I would like to ask you, and I will ask the same question to the other members of the panel, um, what is most important in keeping the internet open from your perspective, government and telecom regulator in Colombia? Thank you. So thank you, Anne, and thank you, Andy, for the invitation to be the, in this panel. and. Uh, uh, we we uh, appreciate a lot the efforts that the OECD has put in uh, studying and commenting the regulations of Colombia. You just mentioned the um, the, the review that you just conducted in Colombia and uh, regulations, telecom regulations specifically, uh, that has been very very valuable for for the Colombian government. So um, uh, I think there is a. I, I, I wanted first uh, to address uh, that the mandate of the regulator of Colombia is basically to promote competition and investment, uh, having always in mind that our, uh, our end or, or goal is uh, to promote consumer welfare. So in that sense, uh, basically we, we have just set a set of regulations that are aimed to preserve the openness of internet, but also the competitive neutrality that is required in order to have uh, a lot of competition between contents, a lot of between competitions between the different layers of the internet, and, but mostly the most mm, or guarantee the, that uh, consumers get the most from the internet. So, uh, as you just mentioned, I'm going to try to use this. So. Um, uh, Colombia has had uh, some sort of re a relationship that is just starting with the OECD. Uh, uh, we started the accession process thanks to the invitation that the OECD made last year. And, uh, and, and, and we have produced a, 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 a several set of recommendations. And uh, some of the issues that uh, regarding the internet uh, were covered in the, in the telecommunications review and in the innovation policy review. Um, but getting back to the to the point of this discussion, uh, most of the dimensions of the of an open internet are today, and this is a, a, a graph that uh, was produced by ISOC, um, uh, are based on these four uh, pillars, uh, based on technology, economy, society, and governance. And the policy of the government has been to guarantee as much. Um, openness to the internet in order to 
uh, set this regulatory framework and they and provide the incentives in order to have mm, or reduce all the risks to uh, the open internet. We, in, when we discussed the um, uh, at the beginning of the OECD uh, process of accession or the process the, of Colombia looking for accession to the OECD, uh, we signed the internet making uh, policy making principles as a commitment of the country in order to uh, guarantee that there is an open internet. In addition, um, uh, uh, and as you have seen and analyzed, one of the largest risks that we see as regulators are the different interpretations that there are regarding the neutrality. The government through uh, and, the, um, and the Congress through law mandated that we as a regulators should uh, determine a set of rules regarding net neutrality. And these rules that were passed in 2011 are not different from the rules that the other countries in, uh, in Latin America and in different jurisdictions have pass regarding the neutrality so basically we develop uh, five principles based on non-discrimination free choice the transparency of, uh, of different policies and the free access uh, of information and of course the quality of services that uh, should be granted uh, to um, internet services providers to users but in addition, the government has had another um, uh, set of policies. So one of one of the very latest ones that uh, is uh, trying to eliminate linguistic all the linguistic uh, barriers that may risk the access to an open internet. So we develop certain applications and, 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 uh, that allow people to get access to the internet in their language. Mostly these are indigenous people, which are uh, usually the um, indigenous from the north and the south of the country, that they speak uh, well, uh, a language that is completely different from uh, Spanish, that uh, they want to preserve, but uh, that's not a reason not to have access to internet. So the government engaged in this project uh, to grant this um, uh, indigenous communities the opportunity to access to the internet in their language, and they provided these different services to translate, to translate certain web pages to their language, and it's been quite successful because it has allowed uh, mostly kids to access both in Spanish, English, and, uh, and in their own mother language, uh, uh, certain contests on the internet. So basically, um, the Plan Vive Digital, which is um, the, uh, the plan that uh, has uh, um, developed the government during the year 2010 to 2014, has a second part. And this second part, it's uh, based on the development of applications that allow uh, the use of internet to certain and different communities uh, in the country. Colombia is a very diverse country, but there is, it is also a very unequal country, uh, unequal country where there is a lot of poverty. And one of the challenges that we have is, is, uh, is certainly this, to try to uh, um, shorten the gap between the poor and the rich. And we think with um, more access to the internet, we will allow a lot of people to get access to, to the knowledge that uh, some others um, in the past didn't have. So uh, that's basically it. So we are in the government are trying to do as much as we can in order to uh, open internet as much as we can for everyone. Uh, first, from a regulatory perspective, setting the right regulations in order to have more competition in the market, but as well from the policy perspective, um, uh, developing all the products and all the uh, and providing all the incentives in order to have much more access to people in um, different er areas of the country and uh, making that the linguistic barriers and other barriers uh, such as the poverty barrier and the um, and the barriers uh, related to the use of technologies are not seen and don't constitute an, a limit to the openness of internet. Thank you very much, Pablo, for this. Thank you for highlighting the, the issue of competition, which, which is important, but also to, uh, for mentioning the, the importance of an access as broad as possible, including to populations which are less favored. Um, I would like now to turn to Emily Taylor. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Emily, Joe? Okay. Um, I'll turn now to Emily. All right. 
and I think it will follow nicely on, on what Pablo, Pablo said. Emily is uh, an internet governance and policy professional. She has notably uh, impressive experience and expertise in issues that are related to the internationalization of domain names. Emily, I would ask the same question to you, if you would pick a few. What, what is most important in keeping the internet open? Stop. <laughs> Can you hear me? Thank you very much, Anne, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, it's such an enormous subject, you know, to, to, to try to pick one or even a few factors that are important in keeping the internet open. It, it's in a way, it's a little bit like the dialogue on climate change, where very few people would say, I really want the climate to change and for it to have an adverse effect on the planet. But because everybody needs to take little steps to change, it all sort of creates this effect and um, looking about one can see that there are numerous factors contributing to perhaps closing down what we have previously in enjoyed or, or at least risking that and three that I would like to highlight very briefly. Um, the fundamental protocols, Andy, you talked about the importance of keeping the architecture interoperable. The infrastructure has to be um, interoperable, and that was the great benefit that those very simple and open protocols first brought in connecting heterogeneous systems back in the day. As we start to move into the next phase, it's, it's very important that internet addressing and numbering moves on to the successor protocol, IP version 6, so that we can all enjoy the Internet of Things, as, as Vince Cerf mentioned in, in his closing remarks um, uh, uh, on the first day. One of the things that I've been looking at is some of the workarounds that private sector uh, makes. Andy, you talked about private sector conduct. Private sector, in seeking to avoid the costs of implementing this, um, this protocol, IP version 6, uh, are increasingly adopting network address translation on a very, very broad scale. Now, on one hand, Network address translation is good because it prolongs the lifetime of IP version 6 and it's necessary. However, the consequences of doing it more and more and more is that you create opaque networks and you in fact recreate those classic communications single point of control, which actually obliterates an awful lot of the benefits of the open network. I'm not going to speak much longer about this because it's actually the subject of a, of a, of a workshop just after this in room 10. The second uh, one I just want to highlight very briefly is big data. Again, Andy, you mentioned the benefits and the excitement of big data and what that opens up to, particularly to researchers like us who like to geek away with statistics. It's absolutely phenomenal, the, the sort of the confluence of a lot of data being available and the reduction in price in processing power and storage. That opens up really amazing prospects for advancement. For, for economic benefit and social well-being. However, it needs to go hand in hand with some rules of the road, because at the moment, it's uh, um, you know issues like privacy, individual rights are sort of is not really clear who has responsibility for these. Is it everybody? Is it a handful of organisations that have a lot of the data? Who is it and who are they accountable to? Who do we go to when we feel that our individual rights have been infringed or if we want to reverse or question what seems to be an arbitrary decision by this increasingly small number of private companies who hold a vast amount of wonderful data on us. Thirdly, as, as you mentioned uh, very kindly in your opening remarks, multilingualism, and, and Pablo, I think this, this goes very well with, with what you were talking about as linguistic barriers and their impact on access, particularly as we're thinking about who are the next billion, who are the next two billion who will go online. Um, for the last few years, I've been working with URID and UNESCO to produce um, a world report on internationalized domain names deployment. So we think very readily about 
local language content, and Nelly Cruz, amongst others, mentioned that in the opening ceremony, how important that is, and, and applications for uh, people in local language content. But how you get around the internet is really important. And domain names were originally devised so that they would be memorable and meaningful for individuals, so that they could help to locate online resources. Now, even if you have incredibly sophisticated search, as we're lucky enough to have, I, as a native English speaker, like the other 10% of the world's population who are, have a benefit because I can look at the domain names that come up in the search results, and, and I have a sort of point of tri triangulation to see whether I think that's going to be a reputable, trustworthy, credible place to go to in my search. But if you don't read the Latin writing system, if you are Chinese, Korean, if you uh, have different writing systems, Cyrillic, then you don't have that benefit. Internationalized domain names have been available for 10 years, and there are 6 million now registered. That's great, but it's only 2% of the world's domain names, and it bears absolutely no relationship to the numbers of people offline whose writing systems are not Latin script. The main barrier identified by industry experts to mass uptake is that internationalized domain names don't work very well. Until very recently, you haven't been able to use them in email, which is a bit of a drawback. For, in, for example, if you want to use a domain name, there's only a couple of things you want to use it for. You can't use them at all as your user identifier if you want to open an account with, say, uh, Facebook or Google. You just can't do it. But also, a bit like a stick of rock, if you're English, and that has the writing all the way through and you can snap it. Wherever you snap the internet, you will find the domain name system. And it's important, whether it's in certific certificates, which have such an important role in security of transactions, whether it's DNS policy data, it's important that internationalized domain names work all the way through the stack. Local language content is burgeoning. People want to be online creating lang content in their own language, but if they don't have a domain name system that is helpful to them, the risk is that they will increasingly find other means, and that is a risk that we should all be worrying about. Thank you. Emily, thank you very much for pointing to, to these particular uh, elements which are uh, indeed important, whether it's IPv6 or, or the big data and the privacy and perhaps the shift in power that big data may just you know, um, enable, and then the, the multiple languages and the international domain name systems. Um, I would like now to ask uh, Joel Adef to um, tell us what he thinks is most important in keeping the internet open. Joe is Vice President for Global Public Policy and Chief Privacy Strategist at Oracle uh, Corporation. Uh, is responsible for coordina coordinating sorry, and managing Oracle's international electronic commerce, privacy, and internet-related policy issues. Joe? Uh, thank you, Anne. Um, not to disappoint Andy, I'm going to use the word ecosystem in my first sentence. Um, um, the big laughter from the OECD people is I've been at the OECD for roughly 17 years in one capacity or another, and I use ecosystem every day. Um, but when I think of open and I think of the internet, I think of the, op of the open ecosystem of the internet. And it goes along a number of different fronts. So I actually have more buckets than Andy's four buckets. And I will say that they generated from a document that was developed in APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, called the Digital Prosperity Checklist. And those are what we used to call the six I's. They were infrastructure, innovation, investment, information flows, intellectual capital, and integration. Infrastructure was what is your technology infrastructure, which I won't address because the bill's coming behind me and I would be amateur hour compared to what Bill will say on the issue. Uh, but you're also your regulatory infrastructure, including your policy infrastructure. 
Um, those are in your technology infrastructure, obviously. Innovation, how does an economy support innovation? That goes to policy, that goes to education and training, that goes to a number of different issues. Because we can't just think of open internet as, gee, the pathways are open. This is an ecosystem that has to be open to make the internet meaningfully open because the internet operates within jurisdictions that have policies, practices law. It is impacted by business policies and practices. It is impacted by technological decisions that are made along the way. So we have to look at all of these issues. Similarly with investment. We talk at the IGF about the need to get a stable investment for the IGF. We talk about the cost of an IPv4 to IPv6 transition. You look at, at startups who are trying to benefit from the open internet and do they have investment capital available from the, for them. So again, that I is important. Information flows of currency, if data is the currency of the new economy, some people say the oil, but whatever, um, then the ability to use and manage information is critical. Whether it's in a big data application and you may or may not want to figure out how to secure the, you, well, you not may or may not, you have to figure out how to secure the information, how to assure its privacy, how to assure its proper usage. Again, that's part of the ecosystem of what open means. Intellectual capital is the ability of the people in terms of technology skills, linguistic skills. Linguistic skills also go down to the, the names that you can use and the, what's in local content, whether you can get to local content, whether your alphabet works in the way you're trying to use content. And finally, integration was the I in which APEC cheated because that I stands for trade and we couldn't come up with a better I for trade, but that means trade at the border, across the border, and behind the border. And those issues are, criti are critical because one of the benefits of the internet, uh, the digital economy, and the information society is the potential for economic growth, the potential for societal benefit, the potential for job creation, the potential to make life better. One of the reasons we want to use big data is to do a lot of improvements, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in city planning. Unfortunately, a lot of what we hear today are big data applications when it comes to something related to marketing that may have a, a, a more uncomfortable factor. But when you think about how big data can be useful because you find correlations in patient treatment that you wouldn't otherwise know, which is one of the things the OECD work is geared to, those are the kind of things that are important. And to give the OECD credit, one of the, one of the forums that put these issues on the map that put the open internet on the map was the OECD ministerial, which took place in Ottawa. It was a transformative event. It laid the groundwork for how we thought about policy on the internet for decades after that. And so these are important issues which we need to discuss and come to terms with, but we need to understand them. And across those six eyes, we also need to understand that as you affect one, you affect all the others. So if you constrain one, you will constrain the others. They are interdependent. It is a matrix of sorts. So, you know, from a business perspective, the open internet is a place where it has to be open for innovation. Andy talked about permissionless innovation, which we certainly support, although we always add the footnote, that doesn't mean outside the rule of law. Um, uh, clearly, uh, the concept of being able to support innovation, a variety of business models, a variety of applications. Um, one of the most interesting uh, examples I've ever heard of related to kind of the, the transformative nature of the open internet, and it doesn't go to any of the social boundings of open, it just goes to the potential, was the hole in the wall project in India, where literally someone made a hole in the wall put a computer through that hole in the wall, didn't have an instruction manual, didn't have anything else, it had access, and people just figured out how to use it. There was no manual, there was just curiosity and innovation at work. And when the internet is not bounded, that works. When the internet is bounded, that fails. Because the horizon of the possible becomes impossible. And so the open internet is important because the possibilities right now are substantial. We need to assure the trust, we need to assure the reliability and all those other issues, but the open internet is the base upon which we build. Thank you. Joe, thank you very much for, for this presentation. Um, I noted the, the importance of um, 
this digital prosperity checklist with the six eyes, not the five eyes, but the six eyes. And um, I think it's the interrelation, the interdependency across, among these different elements. I think you're perfectly right to, to highlight. Um, I would like now to turn to Bill. Um, Asking him the same question, Bill is um, the executive director of Packet Clearing House, which is an international organization responsible for providing operational support and security to critical internet infrastructure, including internet exchange points, and the core of the domain name system. So from your perspective, Bill, what is most important in keeping the, open, the internet open? Thank you. Um, first, I'd just like to thank Sam and Andy and Anne uh, for 10 years of really beneficial collaboration on uh, bringing quantitative information to inform policy making uh, and improving norms and public expectations and so forth as a result of that. Uh, we've, I think, really benefited from, from working together. Uh, and we're really happy to have our exchange point efforts highlighted in the last uh, ministerial in Seoul, and we're looking forward to working together on cybersecurity best practices for the next one in, in Mexico. To, to turn to the question, I think the, the thing that interests us most, ab most about internet openness is the ability to compete, the ability to be a new market entrant. We look at at markets throughout the world and try to figure out what about that market is working, what about that market is not working in the internet. And the markets that don't work well, that are not growing, that are not keeping up with global rates of growth are the ones where there is a lack of competition and innovation, a lack of ability for people who are dissatisfied with the status quo to enter the market, innovate, and exceed the, the, the previous norm. Um, the markets that uh, do better than global average tend to be the ones with lots and lots of small and medium-sized organizations that are all competing to bring new ideas to market, competing to interest new customers, bringing things to market at lower prices that uh, allow a larger base of customers to take advantage of them, to build upon them, and to create new industries. Um, the internet fundamentally is a utility in the same way that roads are a utility. Uh, if a business can't do business on the internet in the same way that a business uh, would do business on the roads, you know, putting a product in a truck and sending it to market, uh, that business is not going to be able to thrive. If a, if a bakery had to pay a toll every time their delivery truck left the garage, you know, they just wouldn't be able to to grow at the rate that they do where in a society where the roads are a public utility. The internet, the, 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 the point there is not to say that uh, governments should be pri providing internet for free. That really doesn't work well when it's tried. The point is that the governments should be ensuring that there's an environment where the public can provide internet service to itself at as low a cost as possible. And that's what happens when you allow uh, new market entry in a really unconstrained way. You get fast innovation, fast growth. If you look at growth in economies, it doesn't come from big monopoly companies, right? They kind of churn along, they do their thing, they extract as much rent as they can, but basically they're doing the same thing year after year. All the growth comes from little companies. All the new employment comes from little companies. All the innovation comes from new little companies, from kids who get out of school and have a bright idea and a lot of energy. Um, I think that we, we teach a lot of workshops um, to regulators and uh, talking about internet regulation. And one of the big points that we try to make is that the simplest distinction you can make from a regulatory point of view between successful economies and unsuccessful economies. In the successful economies, they use class licenses really sparingly, and they avoid individual licenses 
whenever possible. And in unsuccessful economies, they don't really have class licensing. Everything is an individual license. If you want to innovate, you have to pay up front for the right to do it before you're allowed to try. Right? In a class license, you go, you do your thing. As long as you're obeying the rules of the road, you're free to try. So that, that makes a huge difference. And the test that we ask people to apply, the sort of intellectual uh, exercise to figure out whether what they're doing is going to work well, is we say, if a kid graduates from high school and decides that they're not satisfied with the service that's provided by you know, the largest, the dominant player in the marketplace, and they want to compete with the dominant player in the marketplace, what roadblocks stand in their way? How many of those roadblocks are regulatory? How many of those roadblocks are taxation-based? How many of those roadblocks are legislation that special cases things in favor of that incumbent? Um, and if, if they have those kinds of roadblocks in place, they are preventing innovation, and those are under their control. Those are things that the regulator can deal with and can, uh, those are impediments that can be removed from the path of progress. So that's my take on open internet. Thank you very much, Bill, for highlighting um, Lowers, uh, lowering barriers to entry as one dimension of openness. I think it's important. We've had quite a varied uh, presentation of, of issues uh, around the openness of the internet. And now we have 45 minutes for discussion with you, remote participation if there is any, and among the panelists. So let me first ask if anyone in the room wants to ask a question or follow up on what someone said on the panel? Or shall I start directly with the, the speakers? <laughs> I just wanted to know what is the uh, hole in the wall? Yeah, H hello, I just wanted to uh, wanted the clarification about the hole in the wall innovation or something that you talked about. Uh, don't, don't get it. Hole in the wall. In India? Yeah, it was, it was someone that did kind of an experiment where there was a wall. They literally carved a hole in the wall, put a computer terminal there with a keyboard and internet access and just saw what people did with it without giving anyone instruction. And it wasn't people who were necessarily, this was a few years back, so it wasn't people who necessarily had an aptitude already at it. And by trial and error, people started to do things, use it, and innovate. And it was just the question that, left in an unfettered fashion, people will find a way to innovate. One of the best examples is, his daughter knows how to use an iPad better at the, his daughter already knew how to use an iPad better at the age of three than I did. And that's because she's native to that technology. Uh, you know, and these are the kinds of things where I think we see what can happen when you don't bound innovation. We see what can happen when people are free to invent and use things in new and innovative ways. The more you put conditions on their use in advance of them trying something, the more you constrain innovation. That was the, that was the purpose of, of that story. Absolutely. So, I, uh, just, sorry, I, I just want to follow up on that example because it's, it, it, it happened something in Colombia that was quite interesting. Um, uh, the Colombian government has a plan to deliver tablets to different regions of, uh, of Colombia. Some of them are very, very far away from, from the city centers and you need to take like four or five hours um, uh, through a river and basically you only have 2G networks or 3G networks there. So. Uh, something they, they, they deliver some t some 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 tablets to these uh, kids, and of course tablets were restricted just to educational material. Four months later, uh, when they arrived, all tablets were packed with games. Yeah, but what was incredibly interesting is they didn't even have a they never had a no one to teach them how to use the internet because the teachers didn't have. Uh, enough um, 
uh, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, they, 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 they didn't even know how to use internet. But these kids in four months learned how to hack the uh, system that the, the government has put in order not to allow them to, to install games. So what's very interesting is that uh, the internet just, uh, and they just had a 2G or 3G connection, allowed them, just, just internet allowed them to learn how to hack their own system in order to get what they wanted, which was games. And, and it was very interesting that it was not an experiment, it just happened. And it just happened out of the, 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 um, the development of policies. So uh, what, we, what we've seen is that it's a proof that just putting internet there mm. in the hands of someone who has never had the opportunity to have it, it's enough to learn, to give him the tools to learn how to even hack the, the, the same system that has a lot of restrictions. So it's a, it's, it's a very good example of what, uh, of what has happened, and, 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 I, and I thought that uh, was a very close um, uh, example of uh, with the one you just saw. I, I would just add that my story did not condone hacking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. There's a question over there, and I saw one, okay, one, two, three. The, the lady in the middle? Or, okay, you'll be next. <laughs> Thank you, Salam Yamoud from Lebanon. My question is, would like to comment on the legal aspect or the legislative aspect on, of, of an open internet. May I, may I ask you to be a little bit more precise in your question when you say legal aspects of the internet, are you meaning laws on the internet or? Yes. Who wants to, Emily? Thank you. As a recovering lawyer, I guess I can uh, try to attempt to answer that. It is a very broad aspect. I think one of the, the fundamental things is that offline laws apply to the internet just as they do in everyday life. But I think that the, for example, the reactions to the revelations of mass surveillance last year, I think really highlighted um, some gaps and, and the fact that, uh, you know, even even in the sort of uh, across the Atlantic, if you like, that European leaders became very aware very quickly that they were unable to safeguard the fundamental rights of their citizens when it came to processing of data outside of their jurisdiction. So I don't know if that's... Uh, that's where your um, question was intended to, to lead, but I think that you know, as as everybody starts to participate in the internet in this single network, then national laws uh, or regional laws become more and more strained at the edges, and the gaps in you know the the disparities between different jurisdictions become more and more problematic. I think that areas where this is particularly keenly felt are in individuals' privacy and fundamental rights, in the area of copyright and uh, you know versus access to information but you know as the the population that are online increase and diversify more and more of these tensions i think will be felt um, it, uh, through conflict of laws thank thank you I'll thank you emily okay joe and and then andy yeah. i guess i would also say that you also have to worry about the constraining nature uh, of legislation. So legislations will sometime be written at a level of granularity that make them obsolete before the ink is dry on the page. Uh, legislation will sometimes not understand how it should apply or take into account certain things. Um, I'll, one example I'll just use of when people are thinking about legislation, when Massachusetts came up with a Digital Signature Act, so an act that would um, allow digital signatures, they actually went back and did a search of all previous Massachusetts legislation and found 400 instances where Massachusetts legislation referred to a signature, a handwritten signature, or an ink signature and then had to make decisions across those pieces of legislation as to which ones would be subject to the digital signature legislation. Because they decided, for instance, that when it came to signing your last will and testament, 
Maybe they like the idea that you would actually put your initial on every page and sign at the bottom so that grandma wasn't taken to the lawyer by the greedy grandson and said, just push this button, grandma, and we're going home. Um, so you know, there's a lot of consideration that has to be placed in it. And legislation, by definition, is not well suited to keeping up with technology. So from a business perspective, it's not a question of the absence of regulation, but regulation written at a level where it's applied and it can be applied over time, not where it attempts to micromanage. So look at the what, not the how. Thank you for that. Andy has accepted to skip his, his turn to give you the, the floor. So the lady in the middle, then I'll take a remote participation, then I'll go back to the gentleman. Hi. Um, I work for the British government, and the economics of the open internet is one of our favorite things to talk about, but we have very little hard data on it. So if anyone up there has any good hard data, please get in touch with me. Um, but I'd be really interested to know how you might rationalize China's position um, and their sort of economic dominance, given that they are the... the is, I shouldn't say this given my employer, but they're fair to say they are antithesis of the open internet. So is it just purely their size that lets them get away with it, or what else could it be? Thank you for this question. Andy? Bill and Andy. Andy first, Bill second, okay. Yeah, uh, in terms of hard data, uh, when you find some, we'll be interested in as well. Uh, we are trying to amass whatever we, we can, but it will take some creative uh, uses. That said, some of my colleagues in particular, Sam working with Bill and, and, and others, uh, have done work on you know issues of Rev 4 to Rev 6 that Emily was talking about, issues of termination, peering, and so forth, which are maybe not directly on topic, but related. Re related to China, I think it's too early to tell, okay? Uh, I think, well, f f first of all, the growth isn't what it was five years ago. They too are having a slacking. Um, they're facing huge internal challenges. Uh, and, and it's my thought so far from what I've seen, I, I welcome people correcting me, that, that a lot of their efforts in this area have been replicating uh, applications and approaches that have been borrowed from uh, other applications around the world. I'm, I'm looking for indigenous killer apps coming out of China. And if you know of them, please correct me, but I haven't seen them. And so by cutting yourself off, I think you, you limit that knowledge flow. You even limit your ability to replicate other things going on in the world, at least in fast enough time to get market share. And so I'm cautious uh, that I wouldn't judge things too quickly. Thank you. Bill? So um, I just sort of jotted down four different things that I think uh, contribute to China's, what, what economic dominance China has in the area of the internet. Uh, I'm not going to argue about whether it's significant or insignificant or how it compares to other things, but what they have, four things that, that occur to me. First of all, they've got Hong Kong on the outside of the firewall. Hong Kong is essentially a giant free trade zone that is not subject to uh, the same kinds of controls that uh, Chinese domestic uh, internet is inside the firewall. Second point is inside the firewall, they engage in really aggressive import substitution in the same way that, say, Brazil does in the automotive and aviation industries, and you know many other countries have done at various points uh, early in their their industrial development. Um, so uh, you don't see a vast amount of inbound bandwidth into China uh, across that firewall, and. By making it a little bit difficult, by adding a little bit of friction at the border, in the same way that you would add uh, a tax on an imported uh, piece of equipment, um, they encourage people inside the border to consume a domestically produced service rather than a internationally produced service. Uh, third one is language. Uh, most people inside the firewall, inside China, speak Chinese. Most people outside the firewall do not speak Chinese. Therefore, the content in, China, in the Chinese language tends to reinforce this 
perimeter around China. Uh, so they tend to not import so much content from the outside because most of the content outside is not in the language that people inside speak. This is very different than, for instance, the 10% of the world that speaks English. Compare China with New Zealand. New Zealand is a tiny country, a tiny fraction of the English-speaking world. Most of the content that people in New Zealand are consuming in their own language is produced outside their country. Not only outside their country, but across a huge ocean, at least one of them from them. Right? Um, the fourth one is something that China and India are both pursuing very aggressively and for, for different reasons but with the same sort of overall form and outcome and that is uh, building international fiber. So China and India are the two dominant players in the undersea fiber laying industry globally. Uh, they. Uh, for China, a lot of this has to do with um, uh, soft power projection. For India, it's much more to do with pure economic benefit, right? Um, that gives them two benefits. First of all, obviously there's the revenue associated with hauling other people's traffic back and forth between continents. Uh, and the ability to retain the profits from hauling traffic in and out of China and across those oceans, rather than giving up those profits to uh, an owner of fiber elsewhere. Uh, the other benefit, though, the soft power benefit, is the ability to help uh, their allies. Right? This is something we saw in the Russian attack on Georgia. Um, the only country that was able to assist Georgia during that period was, in fact, Turkey. Turkey was the only country other than Russia that had fiber into Georgia. So Turk Telecom was able to, in, insofar as Georgia was able to stay online at all, it was because of Turk Telecom's work. Um, China having their own fiber under their own control into many, many, many countries allows China as a matter of policy to aid their allies if they wish to in the sphere of internet capacity. NATO has no such capacity. The US government has no such capacity. The British government has no such capacity. We just don't have that kind of melding of public and private sector interests that China does. And we, you know, part of being Western countries is our values say that the government isn't there to compete with the private sector and the government, the private sector isn't just there to serve governmental interests. So it's not clear that, I mean, there's, there's no reason to say that we want to go in that direction, but there is a strength that they have in, in that focus and that, that coherence that we don't have a, a, a complementary response to. Thank you very much, Bill. Emily, you want to add something? Just a very quick response to your question. And, uh, on, the, um, uh, on the language protocols, actually there's, there's not such a closed story coming from China. There's a history of, of cross-border collaboration in, in doing the very intricate and difficult work um, in the CJK community with, um, between Chinese, Japanese, Korean and other uh, um, countries in the region, uh, countries and, uh, 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 you know, so to, th there is a, so there might well be a closed sort of uh, situation at the, uh, at the application level, uh, but the engineers are busy collaborating away across borders and doing some really wonderful stuff in collaboration with others that brings, that advances the protocols and has done for, for the last decade or so. But another issue is I think this sort of, it's interesting to reflect on where ideology confronts evidence that contradicts it. For example, if you go, well, government keep out of the internet. Um, I was part of a study a couple of years ago on the UK's adoption of IP version 6, and a bunch of us complete uh, died in the wool free marketers looked at this issue and looked at who was doing well and who was doing badly. Now, the UK, as you'll be aware, is behind the curve on IPv6 adoption on any measure you care to adopt. 
not. However, when you look across the world, the uncomfortable fact is that where IPv6 is doing well, the government has a hand in it. Now, that is a very uncomfortable finding that the evidence produces. And I think as researchers, we have to be able to swallow that and to, uh, to accept it when the data throws up uncomfortable anom anomalies that challenge our ideology and to be able to make policy decisions accordingly. Interesting, interesting point. I would like, before I go to three gentlemen, I think, in the room, I would like to take the remote question. Thank you. Hello. Oh. I have a question from Bill from Texas. So I think we've already talked about that, but maybe if we can go more directly to the point. For him, the question is, what is the strongest argument to convince developing countries to keep their networks open? Excellent question from, from Bill. May I ask Bill, perhaps, to, if you want? Sure, I'll give it a shot. So. Uh, what's the strongest argument uh, to developing countries to keep their internets open? Um, I think there's, there's this sort of three-way divide that I've observed over the last few years, particularly around the issue of internet governance. And I'm going to paint a caricature picture here. Um, I'm going to say that there is one camp that is the OECD countries. And I'm going to characterize those countries as not just the members of the OECD, but the countries whose governments recognize that the internet is fundamental to their economic success as a country, as a society, whatever. Right? That if you get rid of the internet, their economies will be severely degraded. So that's one camp. In the other camp, and I'll characterize this as the uh, China, Saudi Arabia, et cetera camp, there are countries that are very concerned about the government's ability to influence public speech and public thought and the impact that the internet has on the government's ability to exercise that control. So in this camp, the economic benefits of the internet yeah, nice, but the social dangers of the internet are far more strongly considered. And the third camp, which is the largest camp, are the countries that are not yet deriving vast economic benefits from the internet and don't really have a lot of means of controlling public thought or public speech yet. And so these are the sort of on the fence, undecided countries. And the developing countries are by and large all in that third camp. So we have um, you know, the fight for internet governance, whether the internet is going to go in an open direction or whether the internet is going to go in a fragmented direction. And on the sort of OECD camp side, the argument is that if you side with us, your economy will benefit and uh, your people will prosper and they will enter the middle class and their children will receive better educations and they will have clean water to drink and so on and so forth, right? That this is a clear and demonstrated path to economic progress, industrial development and prosperity. The problem is that the Chinas and Saudi Arabias of the world say you can have both. You can have control over public speech, and we're not doing too shabbily. We're wealthy enough countries. Uh, so you can emulate us and have the best of both worlds. And it, you know, to, to some degree, they have some facts behind that to, to back that argument up. Uh, but I think very few people who live in OECD countries would happily trade their existence for one in a society where uh, public speech is controlled and the freedom to innovate economically is less open. Um, so I think communicating that to developing countries that are kind of on the fence and looking at these two paths is the most important message. I think helping them understand that yes, on the face of it, you can see that you know, China and Saudi Arabia don't do too badly. But 
if you were to ask people in China and Saudi Arabia which way they would rather live, most of them would say that they would rather live in an open society that values freedom to innovate and freedom to speak. Thank you very much, Bill. I would like to take advantage of the presence of, of Pablo, who is from Colombia, to ask him if he can respond. But beyond Colombia, for Latin America, where there are a number of developing countries that maybe are in not the OECD camp as you defined it, but one or the other ones. Well, if I understood well, the question is basically what is the most important reason that you can give someone to have uh, the open internet for developing countries. And I think it's based on a general principle. And the general principle is that the open internet as, uh, um, at some point guarantees the general principle that we require to give people equal opportunity for all. And uh, what we've seen in Colombia in, uh, and, in, um, um, in, in, and in the experience of different other Latin American countries is that internet gives at some point, uh, and, and having certain uh, the differences, but uh, at the end, allows a children in a very small town of Colombia to have the same opportunity to access to information as someone in Bogota, as is someone in Santiago, or someone in New York, or someone in London. So at the end, an open internet, and that means uh, open in, in, in a full way, guarantees the protection of human rights, including the access to information, the access, and the freedom of expression. And that's uh, basically the most important reasons why an open internet should be kept in developing countries. It has very important um, outcomes regarding economic uh, advantages uh, that it gives to everyone who has access to internet, but the most important one is the human rights protection. It's a tool to protect human rights. Thank you for that. Very important point from my point of view too. May I go back now to the to the room? Okay. This lady is if you can wait a little bit, but behind there was yeah. Thank you. Um Khaled Forati with the Khaled Forati with the World Wide Web Foundation. Um we actually uh, on an annual basis, we produce a, a web index that try to capture uh, the openness of the internet environment. Um, and I, I very much join your colleague here. Um, I, I don't want to use the word ecosystem, just not to make you laugh at me. Uh, but uh, I, I very much imagine the so so the web index uh, is composed of four sub indices uh, that try to capture universal access, um, freedom of openness, um, relevant content, and some of the um, economic empowerment and social empowerment. Um, and it, when, when I basically discuss with, with the ranking and the benchmarking of, of countries as they come and, and tell us why we're ranking this and this uh, and why we're ranking low in that, uh, it's for me there is an interrelationship between all those sub-indices and though all those um, uh, indicators. So it's very much an interrelation between your six eyes. You can't necessarily, we will not rank high on this index if you just focus on universal access. You need to also enable uh, an environment free of surveillance and, and censorship and, and privacy rights. Um, you also need to offer your citizens um, good content and relevant content that, that enables uh, development and, and freedom of information. So I very much uh, join your, in your thoughts around these interrelationships. Thanks. Thank you very much for this uh, comment. Um, the lady was here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm from Turkey. Uh, I would like to ask a question to a gentleman from Colombia. Uh, you mentioned that you resolve all the linguistic um, barriers um, within the country. Now, if, uh, if uh, when you translate the language, if the concept is not there, um, for example, the, the word information uh, is not exist in another culture. Uh, how you resolve this uh, issue? Thank you. Well, uh, these applications that were developed by the government have two, um, let's say, two goals. The first goal is, is uh, not 
to just translate. It's basically to produce content in your own language. That's the main goal. But it has a second goal, that is to allow and facilitate um, uh, access to the information or the free flow of information that is on the internet. And there's where translation uh, uh, works. But basically, the main goal is, is to have the um, tools in order to teach people how to produce content in their own language, so they uh, keep producing content, but also have the opportunity to access. Of course, there will be always problems of translation, and we have it all the time with uh, regularly commonly, commonly de developed languages. Imagine with the indigenous languages that don't even have the level of development that, that, that other languages have. But, but um, what they are basically doing is making tools to preserve the language, having, uh, well, having regard that uh, there are other, uh, other languages that prevail on the internet. So but the tool base, uh, has its own goal, and its most specific goal is to allow them to produce content in their own language. That's uh, their main goal. The other one is accessory, in my point of view, is just allow them to have access to more information. Thank you, Pablo. Mike. Mike Nelson with Georgetown University. Um, I'm really glad that this panel was on the program, and I, I, I hope this webcast goes viral. Um, I also hope that some of you on the panel and those in the room who are interested in, will come tomorrow at 11. We have another panel on the new economics for the, for the internet. Our UK participant ask about where is the real data. And I, I guess I'm hoping this panel will go viral so that you can challenge the economist to do some more work in this area. So my question for each of you would be if you could have one thing that the economists would focus more time and attention on, either a theory or a forecast or data that would help us better understand the internet and its evolution, what would that one thing be? Thank I'm hoping a million people will watch this, including economists, and they'll go, go work on, their, on your question. Mike, you stole my question. So <laughs> that's great. That's great. And each member of the panel will have the opportunity to, to respond. Shall I start with Bill at the other end? Sure. Um, so I, I think um, this question of, of data and uh, uh, analysis is really central to both the value that the OECD provides to the world and also how, uh, you know, I first came to, to work with the OECD. Um, we maintain the, the global directory of internet exchange points, which uh, forms a, a time series data set over more than 20 years now. We've tracked uh, exchange points as they're created, how much bandwidth is produced by each one, and exchange points are the, the factories that produce the world's internet bandwidth. So having that directory, having that more than 20 years of time series data allows us to see how the internet is growing. It allows us to see which countries are net importers and which are net exporters. Um, it allows us to see which countries are consuming more of their own bandwidth and which countries are consuming more bandwidth from certain other markets. There, there are a vast number of analyses that can be done around that. Um, and fundamentally, it's all about price performance, right? It's all about getting the best possible product to the most people at the lowest possible price so that they can use it as a tool to develop the rest of the economy. Um, I think there, there are these sort of very uh, straightforward quantitative bandwidth and price metrics, just knowing how much bandwidth costs. Um, that's something that uh, telegeography has tracked for a long time, the, the retail price of internet bandwidth in different places. But that data set is a very sparse one, and it's not very deep uh, time series wise, and uh, as, as Mike points out, it's very expensive to get access to. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've been looking at the possibility of trying to produce an open source alternative to that that would be um, uh, richer in terms of uh, density of, of data points and potentially over the long term could, could provide a, a good long time, seri time series data set of, of price. 
of internet access. There are also some more esoteric measures that, that we find really valuable. One of the most interesting indices that we maintain uh, from our own point of view, although I think many other people don't really get it because it's a little, little esoteric, as I said, is the number of cross-border ASN adjacencies. So an ASN is an, an internet network like um, uh, France Telecom or uh, Telstra, right? Each of these is a big internet network of which the internet is composed, uh, operated by a different company. Each of these is, is uniquely identified. So when two of these networks interconnect, we can see this in the network topology. We can see that there's an adjacency between those two networks. So you can calculate for every country how many cross-border inter-ASN adjacencies there are, how many networks within that country are directly connected to networks outside that country. So for a country like Algeria, you might have exactly one cross-border connection. For the United States, which for its many failings, particularly in the <clears throat> broadband deployment area, um, still leads in this one metric. The US has about 60,000 cross-border AS adjacencies. Um, and uh, Russia, the UK, uh, a bunch of other countries are, do very well in that metric as well. And so an interesting thing is how closely that metric correlates with metrics around freedom of the press. Um, you know, the, the more open a society is, the more likely they are to allow sort of free publication. But yeah, okay, go ahead. No, uh, she was talking. That was not, oh, pl sorry. please okay. finish. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, that, that's an analysis that requires a bunch of sort of previous calculations and so forth. There are also a lot of things that if you had good geolocation, you could do better analysis. So, you know, we work a lot on geolocation and trying to create open source databases that allow you to do geographic analysis of internet data sets so that you can correlate data from the internet topology with data about from sort of national demographics. So that's another area that I think is a rich unmined vein. Thanks, thanks very much. Really interesting, Joe. Thanks. My answer is less complex. Um, I'd like us to better measure the ripple effects of innovation. Um, there is, the direct effects are somewhat measurable, though difficult because, um, you know, while I, I, I sympathize with economies who try to figure out how to uh, figure out how to tax innovation, uh, innovation doesn't occur in a linear fashion or in one place. If five people are on a conference call, I'm not sure how I allocate the innovation budget to that conference call. Um, but in terms of the ripple effects of innovation, and the ripple effects in specifically an ICT investment, I think it was PricewaterhouseCoopers did a study a few years back in India where it was seen that every dollar of investment in ICT yielded four dollars of investment in corollary industries. And that's not even then talking about the benefit of the innovation itself. Um, then you also have the fact that things are used in ways that are never foreseen. I mean, the, the post-it note, which we all love today, was an attempt to actually develop an adhesive that worked well. It turns out it was an abysmal failure as an adhesive that worked well. And it's abysmal failure made a product that probably made a lot more money than any other tape that 3M ever developed. So, you know, the, the, with the internet, it's not the, I, I don't, I, I, I failed at my project. It's, I developed something six other people figured out how to do something else magnificent with it then four other people built on top of that and that chain of innovation is all part of that investment but a lot of that may never get captured so i guess um to to conclude with the word i opened with it's all about measuring the ecosystem now <laughs> thank you joe <laughs> emily I'd like some um, economic analysis that would enable us to answer Bill from Texas's question in 
a second? You know, what is the strongest yeah. argument in favour of keeping networks open? There must be data out there. Let's measure it. I will be very brief as well. I think uh, there is a matter of uh, accounting uh, that's needed more research. Uh, you don't see national accounts, the internet economy properly represented, and that makes um, the analysis of the impact in a general equilibrium model, for example, of the internet economy in in um, in the analysis. So I think that's uh, uh, the the question that I will ask economists: uh, how to include in the national account the internet economy. Good point too. Yeah, Andy. I hate this question because I could spend a week on it, and <laughs> I hate going last because. Uh, my friends up here have stolen a lot of my um, <laughs> ideas, and so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of um, pivot off of Pablo a, a little bit, that I think economic analysis and the statistics that underpin it don't f well understand the pivot that's occurring from fixed to mobile and the implications of that for productivity, for business, how businesses are organized, how our lifestyles change, how we even, I mean, if you look at statistically, and I don't really want to put everyone to sleep at four o'clock, but we use the pr same price index. We consider mobile services over mobile to be quality-wise the same as over fixed. And that's a joke because obviously there's much greater functionality and you can see the market move towards that functionality and we're not capturing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we have three minutes before the end. I see a last question and then I conclude. But if you can be very quick, thank you. Thank you. Um, I try to be very short. Um, um, I'm from uh, Russian Station for Electronic Communications. We, for the three years, we are making uh, research on the Russian internet economy. And um, we've seen that, well, it's not surprisingly, but we've seen that probably the uh, most important policy that can uh, government implement is to provide uh, cheap access, uh, both to the internet and both to some sort of devices, uh, mobile and others including but uh, not, um, it's not, uh, it's seen only after about three, four years, not uh, just uh, right uh, at the start. And uh, do you think that uh, we probably need to talk more uh, about prolonged effects of the providing access and um, educating users on what they actually can do with the internet uh, and to promote economy? Well, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, we're really out of time. And apologies to the gentleman at the end and to the lady here. We don't have time to take that question, but you can talk to the panelists uh, afterwards. I want to thank all of you uh, on the panel and in the room for a good interactive session. I hope that this discussion will at least um, interest policymakers and the general public um, about you know, why is it is important to talk about an open internet, to preserve an open internet. Thank you very much. Have a good end of the day. Bye-bye. <laughs>